The following video contains spoilers for Master Detective Archives Rain Code. Note that the game's last couple of chapters and ending will be discussed, but not until much later in the video. This video also contains spoilers for all Danganronpa games, including Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony, beginning now. Please consider these warnings before starting. If you're all good, enjoy the video. In November 2010, game publisher Spike released Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc for the Sony PSP in Japan. This strange combo of visual novel and puzzle adventure games may not have been the most original idea to come out of the 2010s, but looking back, it had an almost adolescent obsession with violence that may have resonated with some edgy otakus of that era. While the game did have an uphill battle to be originally released thanks to that subject matter, the contemporary success of the Now series makes a clear counter-argument. Danganronpa isn't a perfect franchise, but it's one that's wormed its grubby claws into my heart since initially playing the first title on my Vita all those years ago. In bold YouTuber hot take fashion, I'd argue that it's one of the best game series to appear during its decade, so I was conflicted when the series openly announced its self-imposed implosion less than 10 years after its debut. Honestly, while my analyst side was eager to embrace Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony on an artistic level for how it ended, there was another side that mourned the conclusion of a series I grew to love so much. I didn't know what the future held for the talented team behind Monokuma and the Bears Killing Game agenda, but even stranger was what did come afterward. The next big step beyond Danganronpa was a rainy city with a big mystery to solve. Master Detective Archives Rain Code doesn't hide its true identity. From the moment you watch its trailer, you know that several key figures from the Danganronpa team are involved, and that's not really a bad thing. Whether it was Kazutaka Kotoka's strangely compelling scenario, Rui Komatsuzaki's instantly recognizable art style, or Masafumi Takeda's suspenseful electronic music, Danganronpa successfully gave itself an identity, one that Rain Code carries in its DNA and has no reservations displaying. But really, in one of the busiest years for games in recent memory, Rain Code was destined to understate itself. It lacked the punch of a Resident Evil 4 remake, the expanse of a Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, or the energy of a pizza tower. But it's been proven that dedicated fans can sustain even quiet releases like Rain Code. There was a strong chance that if the Danganronpa series gripped you in the past, that the series' successor would be at least a small blip on your radar. It was for me anyway. And I think it's time to really talk about Master Detective Archives Rain Code and its conflicted desire to step beyond Danganronpa's shadow. Before diving in, there is one thing that kind of bugs me about Rain Code, and it comes from a pseudo meta angle, one that directly coincides with its older brother of a series. Despite the publisher Spike Chunsoft still holding the name and marketing it, Danganronpa as a series is pretty much done. V3 definitely made it clear that Kodaka and Team Danganronpa wanted to end the story, and while the soft cliffhanger didn't rule anything out entirely, Kodaka has made it public that he did everything he wanted with V3, and wrote it that way intentionally. It's a game that acted as such a critical takedown of endlessly churning out violent killing game titles, so it makes Rain Code, a title that mirrors Danganronpa so closely in gameplay and presentation, a giant question mark. With such decisive closure and harsh condemnation of its series' own continuous success, making a spiritual successor, even under a different name and narrative context, just kind of rubs me the wrong way. It's not literally Danganronpa, but Rain Code is pretty damn close. So how can I really appreciate Kodaka ending Danganronpa in V3 when we're just making it all over again in Rain Code? It's a pretty strange thing to begin a retrospective with, but I think it's very important to consider when looking at this particular game. I'm not against the idea of getting the gang back together for another round, even for a game that's so similar to their past work. We've seen it happen again and again, and regardless of whether it leads to good or bad results, when you hear certain names together, it's not unusual to look back on their history and instantly know what kind of title to expect from them. That vibe doesn't really apply in the same way here. 
because Danganronpa did what it did with noticeable conviction. To make this a bit clearer, imagine if another Danganronpa visual novel was somehow released after V3. If that happened, I don't think longtime fans would digest that game in the same way as, say, Danganronpa 2 after 1. Raincode bends the rules here, making a game that by all accounts is Danganronpa, but under a different contextual umbrella, having its own brand new world and narrative to accommodate the ideas it heavily borrows from its older sibling of a series. This retroactively makes V3's meta-commentary less impactful, since its creators are rolling back the decision that was originally made with such conviction. My irritability toward Raincode's existence after the mic drop that was Danganronpa V3 may seem like over-analysis of that game's message, and maybe it is, but it's something I do want to bring up before diving into the main analysis of Raincode. Raincode begins with the oddly named Yuma Coco Head, who awakens in a train station without a memory to speak of. In an effort to learn more of his past, he's guided onto a train called the Amaterasu Express, which is set to depart to an isolated city called Kanai Ward. Upon boarding the train, Yuma meets several master detectives, investigators with supernatural abilities that give them an edge in solving cases for the greater good. As introductions end, Yuma discovers that he's been linked to a mysterious entity, a death god named Shinigami, who's meant to help Yuma at the cost of his memories. Before Yuma can fully come to terms with the situation, though, one of the detectives is found dead. Then another. Then another. Then another. And another. And with so many bodies aboard the train, Yuma himself is the prime suspect, leading to Kanai Ward's militarized police force, the Peacekeepers, run by the conglomerate of Materasu Corporation, attempting to arrest him once the train arrives in the city. But right before the arrest happens, Shinigami reveals her true self and transports Yuma to the Mystery Labyrinth, a realm where unknowns are given form. Reaching the end of the labyrinth lets Yuma find out the truth behind the murders and clear his name. But prior to entering the Mystery Labyrinth at all, Yuma must first perform the investigation, which to any longtime Danganronpa fan will be familiar territory. Finding clues, recapping events, inquiring with witnesses and other NPCs, it's all the same kinds of stuff that you'd expect from the team's past work. The Amaterasu Express, as Raincode's first major mystery scene, shares much of the claustrophobic vibe that made Hope's Peak Academy so memorable. The train is a suffocating setting, one whose narrow hallways and tight chambers feel like they're closing in on Yuma as he frantically tries to figure out how the murders occurred. By the time he arrives in Kanai Ward's train station, his back is against the wall. And with only the devious death god Shinigami alongside him, the first investigation manages to feel so much tenser than even some of the Danganronpa title's later ones. While the trials did have high stakes, Raincode sets up the Amaterasu Express murder case to feel less scripted and somehow more dramatic in the process. In Danganronpa, Monokuma had a formula. If a body is found, the investigation begins, followed by a trial and eventual execution. The rules and sense of order that gave the trial's structure isn't really in Raincode's narrative. Yuma is always at the mercy of Kanai Ward's shamelessly corrupt peacekeepers, and this feeling of pressure makes Raincode feel so much more real in that sense. Danganronpa's structure is erased, leaving a narrative that's malleable and more gripping as a result. With the investigation complete, Shinigami hurls Yuma into the alternate world of the Mystery Labyrinth which is Raincode's substitution for Danganronpa's trials. Their dizzying and surreal displays of obscured truths, confusion and misdirection abound, the same kinds of feelings that enshroud mysteries in general. In theory, this is a fitting way to present the woven web of a murder mystery. Having Yuma wander the constantly morphing pathways of this foreign dimension makes for a great visual representation. Unfortunately, this is a shockingly surface-level look for Raincode, because the actual structure of the labyrinths follows very linear paths. The unfolding hallways are mostly just for show, occasionally being broken up by quick-time events, mini-games, and reasoning death matches, where mystery phantoms, flashy doppelgangers of characters from the real world, impede Yuma and Shinigami's paths. It's a real shame, because this is where Raincode could definitely have eclipsed its predecessors, but the presentation does a poor job at concealing the shallow labyrinth designs. Sadly, the issues don't end there. What makes the mystery labyrinths most disappointing is their fumbling of the fundamentals. For any mystery or puzzle game, especially ones in the vein of Danganronpa, the actual case design is the focal point. 
how these murders and resulting investigations are designed, these almost Rube Goldberg constructions rich with twists and turns, was always compelling, the kind of wild reversal that makes it all the more difficult to know what the end point is. Right when you think it's all figured out and the culprit is determined, something happens to totally distort the player's perception and open the case wide again. That unpredictability fuels these types of games. If the cases aren't compelling, or even worse, have outcomes that are easy to predict, then no flashy presentation elements are going to salvage it. It's doomed to fail. Raincoat gets off on the right foot. The Amaterasu Express opening case is fantastic. It would make even the most seasoned Danganronpa fan flinch at least a bit. Even better, the lengths to which the culprit goes to pull the crime off is a great translation of the best examples of Danganronpa's murders. Detaching and reattaching train cars that are already in motion to pull off a mass murder is cartoonish in its intricacies, but it's those individual steps to the crime that make the cases so fun to deduce. Gradually seeing how the puzzle pieces fit together is a big part of any deduction game's appeal, gathering the tools and tasks needed to shine a bright light on the bigger idea and the satisfaction of seeing the fragments finally come to full union, then hammering the last nail into the enemy's coffin with a fierce final statement, nothing compares. It's a deduction game's iconic moment, one that so many of the all-time greats have perfected. The massacre on the Amaterasu Express manages to ensnare in all the right ways, combining a wild step-by-step -step murder process with a total demolition of its preliminary expectations. It's a very striking opening act. With the game's chapter-by-chapter -chapter storytelling, Yuma's traumatic train ride opens up the gates to Kanai Ward, a city bathed in perpetual rain that's also heavily isolated from the rest of the world. Yuma joins the Nocturnal Detective Agency, an underground, well, underwater agency meant to solve the mysteries of Kanai Ward, run by its awkward leader, Yako Furio. While Yumo is clearing his name on the Amaterasu Express, four other master detectives entered Kanai Ward, each with their own defining forte, a supernatural skill that helps them solve mysteries. With introductions complete and Yuma still feeling out of place among such elite detectives, his journey in Kanai Ward, the city of endless rain, begins. As I mentioned, Raincoat gets moving in the right direction. Kanai Ward initially holds a good bit of promise in expanding the Danganronpa formula. It is isolated, preventing easy entry from the outside world, but this was likely to limit outside influence from poking endless holes into the logic of its cases. Hope's Peak Academy and the other locales of Danganronpa did the same, but in a stricter sense. So overall, Kanai Ward balances its containment with a wider breadth throughout the city. As the story unfolds, all of the seedy features you'd expect from a cyberpunk story become apparent. From classist regional divisions to militarized law enforcement, Rain Code makes Kanai Ward feel tumultuous and uneasy, topped off by the conglomerate Amaterasu Corporation, which manages to take all those features and centralize them under the giant logo of big business. Admittedly, the commentary does feel a bit surface level in practice. The Peacekeeper's head honchos are all cartoon villains, motivated by everything from corporate greed, selfish desire, or old-fashioned sadism. The outfit is run by a power-hungry madman named Yomi Hellsmile, who doesn't do much to make the Peacekeepers anything more than an antagonistic force to get in Yuma's way. Also, Amaterasu Corporation has their hands in many industries in Kanai Ward, notably pharmaceutical research. But don't expect any kind of scathing commentary on using people's well-being as a method of farming influence and making money. Well, at least not yet. To be fair, I don't think that's what Kodaka and his team were aiming for with Rain Code. Instead, they needed a villainous entity to constantly be causing the Master Detective's trouble, and all things considered, Amaterasu and the Peacekeepers do cause enough friction to keep the player aboard their wild ride through Kanai Ward. When it comes to characters, Rain Code stumbles a bit. While Kodaka's catalog is no stranger to character stereotypes, only a handful of key cast members escape the well-established tropes you'd expect from his work. Yuma himself is almost a carbon copy of his Danganronpa counterparts, using amnesia to provide a blank slate for both the player and the world he interacts with. He's not unlikable by any stretch, but the whole soft-spoken, contemplative protagonist is such a tired profile at this point. Also, Yuma is a detective in training, so he's surrounded by much more accomplished members of the Nocturnal Detective Agency. 
making him feel out of place amongst the detectives. This means that Yuma has to prove that he's a viable member of the team that won't hold his peers back. This is undeniably familiar to anyone who played even just the first Danganronpa, where Makoto Nayagi still seemed unprepared to be surrounded by classmates with such prestigious skill sets. And in Rain Code, this makes for a protagonist where you want to be in their corner, but it's a corner that's been occupied by many other similar characters already. Shinigami, on the other hand, is a brash, opinionated god of death whose bubbly personality poorly conceals an avid love of mysteries and the violent deaths that often accompany them. Her loud and teasing attitude toward Yuma in particular is difficult to ignore, and despite calling Yuma her master, she manages to guide him more often than the reverse. She's not quite as unhinged and unpredictable as Junko and Oshima from Danganronpa, but you would be forgiven for directly comparing the two characters on their designs alone. Interestingly enough, her regular ghost form acts as Raincode's mascot character, an immediate parallel to Monokuma. Though despite being such a fangirl for death, it's clear that Shinigami is actually out to help Yuma, and not just because they're spiritually linked by a contract. Yes, she's pretty rude and disparaging to our detective in training, but she absolutely cares about him, even going so far as to get visibly jealous when other girls, like the informant Kurumi Wendy, interact with him. Unfortunately, Shinigami doesn't have too much of a character arc over the course of the story. There's plenty of mystery behind her motives in the early parts of the game, but it doesn't take long to realize that she's not using Yuma for her own selfish purposes. Shinigami is easier to trust than I believe she should be, making her presence as a literal death god less interesting, and her relationship with Yuma a tad one note. Sadly, things don't get much better with the other detectives Yuma works with, as each one exhibits their own weaknesses and personality. Halara Nightmare is a cold, no-nonsense detective who exerts monetary pressure on clients at every turn. Desahiko Thunderbolt is a loud, uncomfortably forward Casanova. Fubuki Clockford is a sheltered but polite member of a prestigious family. Vivia Twilight is a gloomy, antisocial vampire who'd rather read books than solve mysteries. They're all brought together by Chief Yako Furio, a well-meaning but kind of bumbling leader who feels constantly overwhelmed by the talented master detectives he enlists for Kanai Ward's safety. The entire team is diverse for sure, and I'd be lying if I said they didn't have their own interactions that make for a colorful cast, but the master detectives don't contribute much to the story beyond the utility of their definitive forte abilities. Desuhiko's behavior ranges from irritating to outright creepy, while Fubuki's background as an elite leads her to be extremely naive when talking to Kanai Ward's citizens. Vivia fares better, but this is mostly thanks to the case that occurs during his major chapter. He's a depressed recluse that has no real interest in finding the truth, putting him in a peculiar place as Yuma fights to solve mysteries. Halara is really the only master detective that really clicked with me. Despite a standoffish personality and a perceived lack of altruistic motivation to help others, Halara manages to find dimension as Yuma's journey moves on. There are brief and satisfying moments where that cold exterior dissipates, especially when animals are involved, so Halara manages to have a strong development throughout the game, making it very rewarding to see how that all is implemented throughout the story and dialogue. The chapter with the urban legend of the Nail Man also moves in a good direction, steadily showing Kanai Ward's seedy underbelly. Urban legends are a natural fit for a deteriorated world like this, and without a ton of significance to the bigger story of Rain Code, the Nail Man chapter is a great way to get things started within Kanai Ward's walls. The pool of suspects isn't too big out of the gate, easing the player in, but countering the expectations with its locked room scenarios, Halara's post-cognition forte skill, along with Yuma's ability to share others' fortes via coalescence, and the tag team culprit combo. Knowing one piece of the puzzle, then having a whole nother side come into focus, is the kind of surprise that'll keep you guessing. I will say that it's a bit more predictable than the massacre on the Amaterasu Express, at least in how the actual murder was pulled off, but overall, I'd argue that Rain Code's initial murder mysteries are set up in a compelling way that doesn't show its full hand out of the gate. There are still plenty of unknowns that stay hidden. Until you actually get to the mystery labyrinths. As I mentioned earlier, predictability is kryptonite for a great mystery story. When you see what's coming, the drama and intrigue erode away quickly. The investigations have the advantage of presenting a ton of information in a short period of time, so it's difficult to see the complete picture early on. That's a good thing. However, the way the mystery labyrinths are structured does a sloppy job at retaining that unpredictability. 
The first major example of this, in my opinion anyway, is Chapter 2, A Silent Curtain Call, where Yuma and Desuhiko infiltrate an all-girls school in disguise, only to witness an on-stage death right when it happens. After gathering clues and collecting information from the students, Yuma and Desuhiko travel with Shinigami to the Mystery Labyrinth to find out who killed the star of the production. The case stays compelling throughout the investigation, with some clever tricks being found as to how the culprit pulled off the murder. But there's a point in the Mystery Labyrinth that immediately stood out for me. Here it is. Secret paths? See? If you look at it this way, doesn't it all seem like the same road? You're right. The three how routes are connected into a single route all the way to the who room. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see what Raincoat is saying here, that the culprit is not a single person, but three students who work together to murder the victim. This didn't feel like a dramatic revelation either. It very much feels like Raincoat just dropped the truth in the player's lap without making them work for it. To make matters worse, once this info is shown, the rest of the mystery labyrinth doesn't really add anything to it. It feels like the end of the mystery, but we're still forced to compile the information together simply for the sake of its character's own sluggish understanding. This has been a relatively common complaint with Kodaka's work in recent years, where the player figures out the solution to the mystery before the characters do, forcing the player to mentally meander around until the game decides it's time for the cast to get the hint. Getting the answer before Yuma and team figure it out is a critical issue, and it severely damages the drama at play. By this point, it's clear that the pacing of Rain Code leaves something to be desired as well. In particular, Chapter 3, No Longer a Detective, is where things start to miss a lot, as it introduces the Resistance, a collective of citizens who band together to take down the domineering Amaterasu Corporation. Because what would a cyberpunk dystopian story be without a band of rebels out to take down their oppressors, right? Anyway, this resistance just kind of appears without much buildup. Sure, there is minor foreshadowing, but once their leader Shachi enters the picture, the resistance immediately becomes the focus. Yuma places a lot of trust in the seemingly virtuous Shachi, even with Shinigami doubting the organization's legitimacy. However, Shachi is immediately killed, becoming the victim of Chapter 3, and once the culprit is determined, the Resistance's place in the story is just gone. You can meet up with the alumni throughout Kanai Ward after the fact, but the group's only real long-term purpose is to inch the player forward toward their confrontation with the Peacekeepers. The whole arc treats its main rebel organization pretty disposably, and depending on how deeply you want to analyze it, it can make the act of rising up against oppression appear like a meaningless gesture especially when particular members of your group have priorities that conflict with the team's main goal. But even if you find this interpretation to just be overanalyzing things, it's tough to deny that the actual case design of Chapter 3 is where the quality really starts to come apart. It's an even worse offender than Chapter 2, with so many of its clues pointing directly at its true culprit as early as the investigation section. A character is murdered, the urban district of Kanai Ward is flooded, and who did it? The guy who's good at swimming. That's it. And this is an enormous issue with Rain Code. Its mysteries, from investigation to labyrinth, are simply too easy to figure out. They're transparent. They're predictable. Now, in case you couldn't tell, I am a fan of the Danganronpa series. I've played through all of the visual novels, so I'm well aware of how these types of games work. Trigger Happy Havoc definitely had its share of predictable cases. The opening trial has been memed on repeatedly for how stupidly easy it is, but the case difficulty shaped up a lot by the game's end. Goodbye Despair's opening case is a very strong improvement, throwing the player for a loop with a sucker punch right when the trial is supposedly about to be solved. V3 had a narrative twist to accompany its opening mystery as well, staying surprising even that far into the series' lifespan. The fact of the matter is, if you have experience with the developer's other series, Raincode's mysteries will not reach those same levels of difficulty at all. I think it's a fair assumption to say that fans of Danganronpa are the ones who are most likely to be playing Raincode, a major follow-up to its creator's acclaimed series, which makes it all the more puzzling that the challenge has rolled back so far. Sure, you won't see any 11037 or anything like that, but Rain Code's lighter difficulty is glaring, leading to mysteries that aren't just as fun to uncover. It's so easy to deflate a player's enthusiasm when the big reveal is telegraphed so heavily, and it's even worse when the characters continue to bumble around after the player knows exactly what the gist is. 
The most unfortunate matter is that Rainco never sheds away this issue, dragging it along like an anchor as far in as the penultimate chapter. Right when you start to really get invested in the case, thoroughly contemplating how to bring everything together, one bit of evidence randomly appears to totally give the answer away. In fairness, you still need to determine how exactly the murder was pulled off, but the narrative truly suffers when the culprit's identity does such a poor job in concealing itself. Having such incriminating evidence appear in such an unearned way, it's not a flattering look for Raincoat as a mystery story. It feels cheap. There are some other issues that Raincoat brings up throughout the course of its campaign, too. The detective point system, earned by examining items in the overworld or completing side missions, nets you experience that can be spent on perks in the game's skill tree. This is a nice way to incentivize exploring Kanai Ward and learning about the city, but the lack of overall difficulty makes the entire skill tree seem pretty inconsequential. The side missions let you learn more about particular NPCs and involve some choice-driven challenges to gain extra detective points, but once again, they don't carry as much weight as they should. I personally ignored the skill tree until the very end of the game, and even then I didn't have too much trouble with the mystery labyrinths during those periods where I didn't use it. The experience system doesn't give the player much reason to engage with it, so I'd call it a tertiary consideration at best. Additionally, you can find hidden treasures to unlock conversations with other members of the Nocturnal Detective Agency. These treasures can be tricky to locate throughout the different sections of Kanai Ward, and I find value in opportunities to learn more about the characters. These conversations have the cast explain their feelings about both their roles and their relationships with other characters. It's shooting the shit, but these treasures do feel like reasonable enough rewards for looking around Kanai Ward for them. However, in some crazy way, Raincode's last chapter does win back a lot of goodwill. It's not a grand revelation and has some off-kilter plot points, but it's fulfilling that Kanai Ward's ultimate secret delivers on that prestigious title. Moving forward, we are going to discuss the endgame of Raincode, so if you haven't experienced the game to its finale, I highly recommend doing so before continuing. Big spoiler warning is a go. Raincode's big gist is Kanai Ward's ultimate secret, which the elite agency of the World Detective Organization is aiming to solve by dispatching its master detectives to the confined city. As each chapter closes and each mystery labyrinth is completed, Yuma learns more and more about the inner workings of a Amaterasu Corporation, including something called a homunculus. After Chapter 2's conclusion, the Nocturnal Detective Agency's headquarters is attacked, causing Yuma to get separated from the other members. Fortunately, Yuma is rescued by Makoto Kagutsuchi, a masked man who professes his love for Kanai Ward, but reveals his tenuous relationship with Yomi Hellsmile and the Peacekeepers. Makoto's suspiciously polite demeanor and masked face will likely raise a lot of red flags toward the player, but when it's revealed that he's the CEO of Amaterasu Corporation, it's clear that there's something very shady going on with him. Chapter 4, The Imperfect Insider, has Makoto leading Yuma to the heart of Amaterasu's labs to find out what exactly is going on in Kanai Ward. This is definitely a compelling chapter and a pretty involved mystery to boot, thanks in no small part to Vivia Twilight standing in Yuma's path to the truth. Chapter 4 still suffers from crippling predictability though, mostly due to a single bit of evidence that gives the entire thing away. But it also has the typical you're not done yet turnaround that Danganronpa often demonstrated. Sadly, this switch leads to the entire Peacekeeper organization being fully defused, as Makoto's elite status eliminates Yomi Hellsmile from the picture. The Peacekeeper stood as a tremendous obstacle in Yuma and his friend's way, so seeing them removed from the story so easily retroactively taints their overall influence on the world. For the sake of its narrative, Chapter 4 disposes of the game's most prominent threat, and it all feels incredibly unearned. I really wish it didn't turn out this way. But that's not the end of Yuma's story. Makoto clearly has something to hide, and Chapter 5, And Then I Was Gone, is where it all comes together. After being knocked out by a gift Makoto gave Yuma, the detective in training and the informant Kurumi awaken in the outskirts of Kanai Ward, a dilapidated sector where they discover that the dead bodies they've encountered in the city have been resurrected as zombies. Chapter 5 unloads the lore, with past figures like Zilch Alexander and Dr. Hueska revived, but in a quiet, exhausted form. Yuma and Kurumi also find that the meat buns that Kanai Ward citizens love to eat are processed from the dead bodies of criminals sent to the city. 
Additionally, there are the ideas of homunculi, artificial beings created as immortal copies from the blood of living beings, and the blank week mystery, where a certain week was treated as taboo by Kanai Ward's inhabitants and wasn't allowed to be discussed. This all comes to a head when Yuma and Shinigami encounter Makoto at a shack that's filled with a giant machine churning out clouds over Kanai Ward. As the mystery labyrinth opens, Yuma mistakes Makoto as a mystery phantom before figuring out that the real Makoto somehow entered the labyrinth with him and Shinigami. The mystery labyrinth continues onward, and as the evidence and testimony slowly tether together toward the truth, it all becomes crystal clear. The truth behind Kanai Ward's ultimate secret is that the population of Kanai Ward was killed and replaced by immortal homunculus doubles during a time period called the Blank Week. These defective homunculi go berserk in sunlight, so the sky is covered in rain clouds to keep them sane. They sustain themselves on meat buns made from human flesh. The one protecting them from sunlight and isolating them from a world that would try to kill them all is Makoto Kagutsuchi, the homunculus counterpart to the leader of the World Detective Organization, Number One. And Yuma is Number One. Before moving any further, I want to bring something else up first. There's a particular case in the Danganronpa series that has really stuck with me over time. It's one of the most emotional responses I've felt toward a video game in my life, and one that left me physically drained after solving it. Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair Trial 5 if you're a fan of the series, there's a chance that you know where I'm going with this. The way Nagito Komaeda set himself up to be the murder victim, and in pure ultimate lucky student fashion, organizes another particular student to be the murderer by total chance. That particular student is Chiaki Nanami, the ultimate gamer and the one character who's been leading protagonist Hajime in all the right directions. This trial is important to me for a number of reasons, but what resonated the most with me is something I think the Danganronpa team has excelled at in their best moments. At the beginning of this trial, Nagito appears to have been tortured, but as the trial moves forward, more and more evidence comes up. More and more falsehoods are dispelled. As this evidence accumulated and the reveal became clearer, I began to see that truth that I didn't want to be real. Chiaki was the character who had contributed so much to Hajime and the player's understanding of Goodbye Despair, the loyal assistant who knew much more than she was letting on. I was feeling more and more breathless as the trial progressed, and once I had to choose who the actual killer was, I was running on empty. I didn't want to say who it was, I didn't want to believe it, but I finally knew the truth. Similarly, Rain Code's Chapter 4 is a richly dramatic setup, with Yuma having to come to terms that Yako Furio, one of his most trusted allies, could still be a murderer, someone who needs to have the truth shine down on him, burning him to a crisp. Yuma is shaken by the reveal of Yako's involvement in the killing, steadily forcing himself to have conviction and face the truth. After confronting Vivia in the mystery labyrinth, someone who is content with turning a blind eye from the truth for the sake of his own peace and quiet, the two work together to execute their leader's mystery phantom, while also reminding each other that they aren't alone in bearing the burden of losing a friend. The whole theme of the chapter is accepting the truth, never denying or turning a blind eye to it. It's about continuing onward even if the truth is painful to bear. That's a very thoughtful message, and in revisiting the chapter, I can overlook its telegraph solution and see its more emotive strengths with a clearer eye. If you had been paying attention during Raincoat's final chapter, Kanai Ward's ultimate secret's true answer won't surprise you. The clues provide a clear pathway to the solution, so you're probably still going to find that pacing to be lacking in some respects. But looking back at how I was feeling during the final mystery labyrinth as clues steadily prove the claims, leading me closer and closer to a truth bomb, I think this last chapter came pretty damn close to how I felt with Danganronpa 2 Trial 5 and Raincoat Chapter 4. Maybe not in the emotional way, but in making gradual progress toward what actually happened, then feeling it all come together in a cohesive, fully understood union. The common thread between these three scenarios was a sense of fulfillment. When looking back at Danganronpa 2 specifically, the more I learned what the truth was, the more I wanted to deny it. Seeing a likable character who contributed so much to the story and cast, then having them die at circumstances so unfortunate, it sucked. It really sucked. But that's how the story was composed. 
That was the truth, and it couldn't be hidden any longer. It's an almost eerie parallel to Yuma's feelings not just when Yako is revealed to be a killer, but after Makoto shows his face to him in the mystery labyrinth and declares to Yuma what choice he should make. Makoto encourages Yuma that the perfect solution that a detective is meant to uncover here is to keep Kanai Ward's ultimate secret under wraps, to sacrifice himself to the mystery labyrinth and leave the homunculus population in peace, blissfully unaware of what exactly happened to the city. The truth behind Chief Yako's murderous intent might have been painful, but in Makoto's eyes, the truth behind Kanai Ward is genuinely dangerous. It could destroy the livelihoods of the city's population and potentially lead to even more tragedy. And for a moment, Yuma begins to believe that that's the right thing to do. Maybe a lie would ultimately make everyone happier. Maybe blissful ignorance is the real perfect solution. Maybe the truth shouldn't be known. But Shinigami is a bit more convincing. After all, the whole reason she has a contract with Yuma is because, as number one, he sacrificed his memories of being the WDO's leader so Shinigami could help him find out what's actually going on in Kanai Ward. The result was an unlikely partnership, but one that was able to lead to the truth. Yuma and Makoto have one last crazy-as-hell Kingdom Hearts-esque duel, with Yuma being the victor. While originally the choices were to either leave Makoto in the crumbling mystery labyrinth and let the truth be heard, or have Yuma take his place and keep Kanai Ward's mystery unknown, there is a third possibility. Have Makoto depart the mystery labyrinth to tell Kanai Ward the truth, leaving the homunculi populace to decide their own futures. It's a very risky gesture, but in Yuma's eyes, it's the right thing to do. So Yuma stays in the mystery labyrinth, until Shinigami reveals the special exit that Yuma can use to escape from the labyrinth. The catch is that it erases the contract entirely, meaning he and Shinigami would never have met in the first place. Their partnership dissolved, Yuma, now reverting to number one status again, receives one last parting gift from the Death God. Then, the story of Yuma Koko Head is over. Beyond the absurdities that often trail throughout Kodaka's scripts, Raincode's resolution is an optimistic one. I try to think what I would do if I was in that situation, seeing my entire existence uprooted and dissolved before my eyes, concealed by a heavy-handed lie. Would I be able to live the same way knowing I'm not the person I thought I was? It's difficult to envision, but I think that's why the epilogue chapter exists in the first place. In it, you play as informant schoolgirl Kurumi, who is gathering supplies for her first journey outside of Kanai Ward. Amaterasu Corporation supposedly begins using its technologies for better purposes. There's also an alternative source of nutrition that doesn't involve meat buns made of human flesh. Kurumi says goodbye to the master detectives who depart their headquarters after paying respects to their deceased chief. She then leaves on an outbound train with Shinigami's contract book in tow as she's out to find Yuma, who left the city after becoming number one again. As I said, I believe that Rain Code's ending nails it. It breaks through all the predictability and familiarity to make a world that feels like pure, unbound Kodaka. Coherency be damned. There are some logical leaps that Rain Code demands. Replacing practically an entire city with homunculus copies without any citizens getting the word out sounds outright absurd, even over the course of a week. But Danganronpa had its own generous stretches of the imagination too, so it's difficult to fault things on the Rain Code side of the equation. If you're willing to suspend your sense of disbelief a bit, I think Raincode's ending sends a good message. That the very concept of truth and lies has a rippling effect. That what you believe can actively change things. Danganronpa V3 had similar themes in its story, but Raincode's implementation of those same themes feels more grounded. And less of a utility that's meant to finalize a series established universe. If anything, the satisfaction of closing the book on Kanai Ward's ultimate secret is tough to top with the epilogues showing the population still coming to terms with the fact that they aren't even human. It's weird, and depending on who you ask, a stupid narrative twist, but it embodies the better aspects of Danganronpa's story resolutions, ones with important messages scattered about a goofy, nonsensical plot. That being said, I don't feel quite as charitable toward Raincode as I would with other games, because despite acting as a sort of fresh start for Kodaka and team, Raincode is inferior to the Danganronpa games in many ways. 
While you could easily argue the style over substance approach to the Mystery Labyrinths is the big issue, or that the story is still batshit crazy even by Kodika's standards, both of those are totally valid complaints, I'd say. But I think Raincode's core issue is its lack of real surprise. While this definitely mixes into the predictable case design and the lighter difficulty that accompanies it, I do feel this problem ties into the whole Danganronpa again deal that I mentioned near the start of this video. I remember clearly being super excited for a brand new project from the team behind Danganronpa, one that's recognizable but willing to shake things up for fans of the Deduction Puzzle series. The more I saw of that promo material though, the more I thought, yup, this is definitely the Danganronpa team. I don't think that redoing an idea that works is necessarily a bad move, but aside from its narrative, Raincode oozes familiarity. And when you're looking through the lens of a series that was so self-aware in its continuity that it actively demolished itself on a metaphysical level, there's something kinda off about that, especially when the new result is so similar to its older incarnation. At the end of Danganronpa 1, the surviving students open the door to the world outside of Hope's Peak Academy. A bright light bursts from the other side, but the player doesn't find out what's there. Was it as scarred and damaged as Junko made it sound? Or was everything she was saying a lie? While future games in the series gave the real answer, I do like the ambiguity of that first game's ending. You can interpret it in any way that you want, and that really spread that game's message of hope. Raincoat is the first game in this new series, so I can't help but feel that same vibe as when I finished Danganronpa 1. As flawed as Raincoat is, as much as it goes against what Danganronpa V3 was trying to say, I can't help but be optimistic for its future. It's a format that lends itself well to sequels, and the Danganronpa games have proven that even a polished opening act has plenty of room for growth and improvement. This feeling of familiarity is a valid issue, but I really love the Danganronpa games, so if it has to be familiar, I'd rather it remind me of a series I love instead of one I hate. Master Detective Archives' Rain Code might not entirely step outside of Danganronpa's shadow, but I hope it will someday. Despite that older series implosion, its message of uplifting hope still clings to the developer's work. We're still crossing our fingers that the next installment manages to blow our minds and capture our hearts, even if we're unsure that it will. And you know, maybe that's a good thing. Oh, and just forget about the DLC. There's barely anything to it. You get to see some nice cutscenes and dialogue, but there's no real gameplay here. Okay, see ya.